Singapore's landmass may only span 280 square miles, but it has an outsized influence, not just in Southeast Asia, but increasingly the world. Banks here play a leading role, not just in supporting economic development, but in championing everything from financial inclusion to climate transition. Spend a few minutes chatting with Piyush Gupta, the CEO of DBS Group, and it's clear that he's energized about everything that is happening in Southeast Asia and at DBS, the region's largest bank. Since taking the helm in 2009, Gupta has led DBS through significant cultural change, true digital transformation, and real commitments to sustainability. As head of ASEAN Research, I wanted to learn more about why Gupta, who was born and educated in India, has made Singapore his home, and what he sees for the future of banking. So I sat down with him at DBS's group headquarters overlooking the Malacca Straits, where our conversation did not disappoint. Thanks very much for joining us today. Maybe I can just start off and talk a little bit about your sort of background. So you were born and you started your career in India. What is it that brought you to Southeast Asia and what keeps you here? I started my banking career with the Citigroup, Citibank in those days. One of the biggest attractions to me was uh, making an international career. And so um, very early in the game, they um, offered to move me out uh, into Singapore, which was the regional headquarters. Singapore, uh, the system works. Mm -hmm. And because the system works, you realize you can be very productive. And you can really uh, wind up making an impact. It's a small country, but it punches way above its weight. You've had your fair share of uh, successes, but you must have faced challenges as well. Let me tell you the two or three big lessons I've taken away. I, I think Hemingway said it once in the context of bankruptcy. You know. Things change gradually and then suddenly. Mm -hmm. So that is indeed one lesson. You can't pick up the macro trends because things can seem to be slow and glacial, but then suddenly when you look back, it's all very different. You know, nobody can call the future, but you have to be willing to take a point of view and then you've got to prepare for that. Interestingly and ironically, the second lesson I learned was the complete opposite of that, mm -hmm. which is that um, I believe speed to market is often overrated. I set up a dot com in 2001 and in those days, it failed, by the way, to the dot bomb, but standard uh, party line was um, uh, a year in terrestrial time is the same as a week in internet time. And I think you're better off getting it right rather than rushing to market. It doesn't matter if it takes three, six, nine months more, but getting the journey right, getting the customer value proposition right, it pays. Uh, and I guess the third I'd point out to is something Drucker said a long time ago, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And it took me a long time to realize the truth of that. Uh, I've always been strategic in my thinking, but in truth, I've uh, realized over the years that if you really want to create a broad, sustainable system of change, you can't do it through just the left brain. You've got to be able to create the artifacts of the right brain. How do you engage people, motivate a team, and create a, a system where everybody can participate and do stuff? And I remember you saying that DBS is a, an organization of 33,000 entrepreneurs. So, you know, what have you done to sort of create that culture and let's face it, the banking industry is not renowned for being full of entrepreneurs. Cultures can be shaped by design. So how do you design for culture? One, uh, usually, you've got to be able to create a common shared articulation of what the value system needs to be. What is it that you're trying to promote? The second thing that you've got to do is create incentive mechanisms for people to understand you know, what is it that's accepted and what gets rewarded, uh, what is not accepted and does not get rewarded. And it's not just financial incentive mechanisms, it's recognition mechanism. Uh, and then finally, this is one of my learnings, actually, I, my, my team taught me this. Mm -hmm. uh, culture happens by creating the right nudges for people. So people are always being nudged into a particular way of behaving. And as an example, we wanted to improve the quality of our meetings. And we created was something called a mojo. Uh, Mo is a meeting owner, and that's just the person who calls the meeting together and sets up stuff. But Joe turned out to be really important. And Joe is somebody we called a joyful observer whose only job is to sit in the meeting and critique the meeting and say, how is the meeting going? Is it on time? Are people talking? Are people participating? Is there equal share of voice? And we realized that just the very act of naming a Joe changes the quality of the meeting. You were a very early adopter on technology. So what was it that inspired you to sort of invest early and, and invest so significantly in technology? I have a little bit of an unusual background because I didn't come grew up through the typical route of um, corporate finance or investment banking or markets. I happened to build my career uh, first in the back office, so technology and operations. So my background was some degree of comfort uh, in the space. 
Uh, but the second thing that happened, which I think uh, was really uh, game-changing for us, we happened to be at China's doorstep. And if you look at what was happening between 2010 and 12, the only place in the world where technology and digital was taking off was China. Alibaba was happening, WeChat was happening, even uh, Ping An. You know. And I realized very quickly that my colleagues in Europe and the US weren't seeing the stuff that I was seeing. The third thing that happened is, you know, one of our early strategies that was not working well was uh, our desire to expand into the big geographies for retail and SME banking into China, India, etc. And about then, we also realized that this old way of trying to expand is not going to work anymore. And so when you put all of those things together, it just seemed to us that the right bet to make is to really commit to a complete uh, digital overhaul and a digital transformation. Now, like everybody in banking, I had been through periods in the past where you spend lots of money and don't get too far. The one epiphany we had in 2012-13 is technology itself had changed. And therefore, the challenges that we had in overhauling core banking platforms or changing technology in the 2000s, uh, those were not relevant in the 2010s. Amazon and AWS and cloud native technology had changed the game. Uh, that recognition that the game had changed, and therefore you could do things that were not possible 10 years ago, that was a leap of faith. Yep. And we took the leap of faith, but more importantly, uh, my board took the leap of faith along with me. So you were, in addition to technology, you were also an early proponent of the, uh, the need to go for a climate transition. I think, you know, you were instrumental in setting up Singapore's first carbon exchange. Uh, DBS obviously appointed their first chief sustainability officer in 2016. So what is it that, that led you to, to realize that you needed to do this? You know, I, I said before, this idea that things happen gradually and then they happen suddenly uh, is an important idea in my head. And I think by uh, 2016 COP for sure, it became quite clear that the, the momentum um, around the sustainability agenda was picking up steam uh, around the world. But a true uh, financial risk from a physical transition risk standpoint. Uh, but at the same time, it uh, appeared to us that this was also going to be a trillion dollar opportunity as the world reconstructs itself for a low carbon intensive um, economic model, that transition is not going to happen automatically. And therefore, there's an opportunity uh, in that space. That responsible banking is the heart of what we do in our business. And that's where we think we can make the biggest impact. How do we incentivize customers to set up their own ESG um, uh, targets by providing them incentive-based financing? Uh, how do you do a lot more renewable financing, wind, solar, uh, geothermal, as opposed to fossil fuel financing? And increasingly, uh, we're now focused on how do you do a lot more transition financing? Uh, it's quite clear to us that the extant uh, infrastructure in the world, trillions of dollars, uh, cannot disappear overnight. So there has to be a gradual and systematically thought through pathway where from which you sort of move from gray to green. And do you think that the industry more broadly is doing enough, especially on carbon transmission? Are, we, are they moving fast enough? Well, yes and no. In the last couple of years, early days of COVID uh, including, I was very encouraged to see the groundswell of um, companies uh, making voluntary carbon commitments. At last count, I'd seen 3,000 companies who committed to net zero by 2050. And when 3,000 companies commit, then there's no question that there is some uh, positive uh, momentum mm -hmm. behind that. So that's not bad. At the same time, you know, I worry about the fact that some of these commitments are 30 years out. So unless you have more definitive pathways, uh, you don't know whether you're making progress at all. You know, you can argue the momentum's picking up, but when you look at the outcomes and the results, we are, you know, lagging behind dramatically. Um, on top of that, the more recent issues with Russia and uh, Ukraine, the energy crisis, uh, and the consequent food crisis that's proving to create its own sets of challenges. Relative to five years ago, optimistic. Uh, but I think we have a lot of challenges and we certainly haven't uh, made all the headway that we need to make yet. We've discussed sustainability and technology. I mean, when you think about the next three years or the next five years or the next 10 years, what are the big developments? I'll tell you the two or three technologies which are continuing, uh, already have been but will be game changers. Uh, I think, um, uh, AI machine learning uh, mm -hmm. is fundamental. I think the future belongs to the people who can master data. And mastering data, AI and machine learning is a subcomponent of that, is not easy, but the outcomes of that are just uh, enormous. I mean, 
being able to use uh, artificial intelligence on data sets allows us to do things that we as human beings could never imagine doing. It impacts the way you manage people, it impacts the way you do risk, it impacts the way you do marketing and sales. So, By the way, that has some social uh, implications as well because as societies, we are going to increasingly have to wrestle with how much data is right and how much data is too much. You know, what data is private and what is not private. The second big area to me which is um, uh, quite uh, important is uh, distributed ledger and blockchain technology. And, you know, despite all of the crypto winter and so on, I mean, cryptocurrencies are a use case. At its heart, a distributed ledger technology which eliminates the need for central record keeping is actually uh, quite a big uh, uh, difference in the back office of the world. So you think of a world where you don't need central hubs, you don't need stock exchanges, you don't need registrars of societies, you don't even need banks. It's not getting there anytime soon, but the power of the technology is actually quite uh, uh, extraordinary. And obviously, the nature of money itself, I think, changes. If you look at the history of money in the last thousand years, it's always followed technology from cowrie shells to gold to silver to, you know, uh, to paper to plastic. There's no logical reason why it won't continue to follow technology. So I, I think there's some big changes afoot in that space. I think one thing that will happen is a much deeper development of the uh, of technologies. So carbon sequestration technologies, I think, are picking up stream. I think you'll see a lot more of those. Uh, carbon capture and storage technologies. I think there will be a much more significant development of the voluntary carbon markets. Uh, you might even see some kind of better reconciliation between the regulatory markets and the voluntary markets. Uh, but you talked about the carbon exchange we launched. It is, uh, in anticipation that the voluntary carbon markets will get deeper, they'll get more transparent. Some of the opacity that has plagued these markets since the Kyoto Protocol uh, is beginning to get resolved. So I do think this could become a massive asset class. You're clearly passionate about what you do. Um, what is it that keeps you so excited about DBS? I talked about Singapore. You know, that this is a country with a great platform, punches above its weight. And I feel the same way about uh, DBS. Uh, we're fortunate with our just a tad short of 30% ownership by Temasek, which is the sovereign wealth fund. It gives us the ability to think long. We can ride through the short cycles and we don't get whipped around by just the quarterly number and the quarterly result. Uh, we are in a country that works and we're in a part of the world where the opportunities are massive. So the ability to uh, make impact is very real. So what is it that motivates you to be a change maker? Uh, we went through this exercise some years ago, trying to think about and write our own purpose in a pithy mm -hmm. statement. And after much reflection, I figured that, you know, what I like to do is to help shape tomorrow's world. People call it making impact, but uh, this idea of uh, being able to sense trends and therefore being able to reposition something which is material for tomorrow uh, in terms of value, use, and the way people will live and the way things will happen. That's what floats my boat. Cool. Piyush, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm happy to do this.